Good morning, this is Phil to the Brim, and it is Saturday, January 20th, and we're talking about what about our feelings, and I'm hoping you're learning something I sure have, uh, learning from the Holy Spirit about our feelings, because we're to love the Lord, our God, with all of our soul, with all of our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our strength. And we know that those things are in, intertwined by now. And, and I've been going through, why is it that we sometimes don't feel? And I talked about faith needs to come first. And sometimes that's why. Because faith needs to come first. Or your heart's deceitful. Yesterday I talked about the sinful flesh wanting to be in control. And it needs to be crucified. The flesh cries out to be fed. And it needs to be crucified and submitted and Jesus was our example and Paul the Apostle speaks about hey listen we can't do these things in our flesh it just leads to sin but rather thanks be to God who has given us Christ and now we can do be overcomers through the Holy Spirit I want to also talk today about another reason why we don't feel and this is a big issue nowadays and that is overstimulation our overstimulated culture and it creates an addiction to feeling in our culture and we have an overstimulated culture and it is addiction oriented our entire culture is cultivates addiction and we look for highs we look for spiritual highs for example as fixes to us but those things are momentary. You know, even using the word fix shows that it's like a drug. We're looking for something to fill us for the moment, to make us feel better in the moment, even if it's the baptism of the Holy Spirit, an altar time, whatever it may be, a worship concert, whatever it may be. And the Lord is saying, listen, I don't want you to have spiritual fixes in the sense of uh, just appeasing you in the moment like some sort of good cry that you have and then you go on the same you go back to what you were doing you go back to the sin you were living you go back to an unchanged way you're not living in a submitted transformed life with me the world doesn't want discipline they want uh, uh, fix it fast um, you know give the pill whatever rather than go deep and to the transformation that's needed. And the Lord wants healthy children. He does not want addiction in our lives. And He wants a faith connection with us. And He wants a relationship with us. And so we have to beware of spiritual experiences that produce addiction. In other words, I'm just going after a spiritual experience, a spiritual high. And rather than truly being submitted to the Holy Spirit through the spiritual disciplines, through spiritual destruction, through the Word of God. You know, <laughs> let me just say this. And I don't mean to offend in saying this, but it's like people who just want worship, like music, but they don't want to be taught the Word. And they think the worship part, when they're feeling emotional, is more spiritual than the discipline of knowing God's Word. So they're always chasing after that emotive feeling. And really what it is, is fleshly. It's not spiritual. It's fleshly. It's wanting your senses to be touched rather than your character and your life to be transformed. Because addiction refuses discipline. And the Word of God instructs us. That's what Hebrews says. The Word of God instructs us. And it tears away the flesh from us. The sinful flesh from us. It rebukes us. It trains us. And when we are addicted to spiritual highs, 
we refuse discipline. We think it's boring. We don't think we need it. I've seen, I have been with way too many people like this that refuse the disciplines and run and chase after the spiritual highs, wanting to be fed in that way. And they are very unhealthy people. Many times misuse of spiritual gifts, I would say, tumble into false prophecy, fleshly prophecy, and it's very dangerous, and we have an epidemic of that. It's people chasing after the fix. They have no accountability because accountability is spiritual discipline. And remember, addiction refuses discipline. And the Lord is one who says, ah, you are my sons and daughters, and I discipline my children. And not everything that... God is doing for us and is good for us doesn't feel good. Discipline doesn't feel good. It doesn't feed the flesh. It doesn't feed our emotional desires sometimes. Let me read to you. Hebrews 12, 5 through 11. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines the ones he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while, as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in His holiness. And I'm going to say, a holy life is a powerful life. There's no territory for the enemy in a holy life. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Once again, addiction, spiritual high addiction refuses discipline. We're reading Hebrews chapter 12, 5 through 11. We are to be disciplined children. He wants to discipline us. It doesn't mean it feels good. It doesn't feel good. And therefore, our feelings want to reject the word of the Lord coming forth. Oh, just give me the high of the worship song. That's saying what I want to hear. That I'm a champion. No, he's the champion, by the way. He's the champion. We're only champions in him. But rather, we are to be disciplined. It's not about, listen, worship's wonderful. I love worship. The Lord loves worship. But that is not where it stops. It is to be a discipline, to receive the word, to let that hard work happen in our lives. He wants to do a deep work in our lives. And many times in the deep work, there is a battle within us. There is spiritual surgery that the Lord wants to do in our lives. This is why we have to beware of spiritual addiction. Chasing after the high, rather than submitting ourselves to the Holy Spirit through obedience. Chasing after the high. See, the discipline of the Lord is formational and transformational. But many times our heart or what I say our emotional center, which are, can be our emotions, our thoughts, our will, doesn't like the deep thing. It doesn't like the, what is right, written here in Hebrews chapter 12. It doesn't feel good in the moment. But we are to go to the depths with the Lord because this is the maturing process. This creates holy living, righteous living, fruitfulness of righteousness. Listen, when we have a holy life, the very word holy means separate. Separate from what? The sin. The sin that has easily entangled us. When he's making us holy, we're separate from the ensnarement of sin. Letting the Lord break up that unplowed ground in our lives. It doesn't feel good to break up unplowed ground. But the Lord says, I want to break it up. To create that harvest of righteousness. To deny yourself. To teach yourself. Listen, I will deny myself and follow him. I will pick up my cross and follow him. And denying myself doesn't, isn't bad. It's good. It produces good things in my life. 
the spiritual addiction, the, uh, the spiritual high, people running after spiritual highs, the danger too is that what I call, and they use this term in anthropology and uh, cross-cultural studies, syncretism, where the things of God or the things of the Word become mixed with the things of the world or mixed with other religions, and it's really not the true gospel. But if I follow that spiritual high, and I have seen people who consider themselves mature believers fall into this and now are into it big time, where they begin to take on other spiritual experiences and start to dabble because they're looking for the high rather than saying, listen flesh, listen emotions, you will submit to God. We're going to go deep. We're going to be deep in his word. I'm going to love him with all of my heart, with all of my mind, with all of my soul, with all of my strength. I'm not going to chase after a spiritual high. Yes, I'm passionate about that because I've seen it lead people to destruction and it is deceitful. And our culture cultivates that sensory overload, the desire for more of that. So what else? Well, there are some people who have what I call emotional shutdown. In other words, they have the spirit of control because they have fear or hurt or woundedness in their past, so they shut down. They don't want to feel emotional. They don't want to have the Lord touch them emotional. They don't want the vulnerability of being touched emotionally. And the Lord wants to touch you there. You can't love Him if you're trying to control Him. You can't love Him with all if you're saying no. No, you can't have it. Sometimes that comes from the family of origin, that you were taught that as a child. Sometimes it comes from certain personality types can be more dependent, cognitively dominant. But still, don't you ever use that as an excuse. You are a new creation and you are to be transformed and the Lord wants to touch you so that you are emotionally vulnerable to Him, to His Holy Spirit. Sometimes it's a generational thing. We've seen this in generations, that maybe generations that have experienced war, different types of things, that this was the way you are to be culturally. This is the way you are to be. Emotions are not to be expressed. They are private. You only do it behind closed doors. And there's a defense mechanism there to shut down, to turn off emotions. And the Lord wants to touch your emotions. He wants to heal your emotions. He wants to reach in and say, I want you to love me with those emotions. See, the Lord does want to teach you to love with your soul, with your emotions. The Lord wants to teach you to love with your soul and with your emotions. Psalms 23, 3 says this, He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. We need that soul restoration. If we deny our emotions, we suppress them, we check out, we fear having emotions, we need that soul restoration. You know, I find that it's interesting that after he restores my soul, later in scripture it says that he, he guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So in other words, he's restoring, he's changing my soul. He's making my soul worship him, be uh, in submission to him, whether it be that you're like all over the place emotionally or whether you're shut down. And it reminds me of what Hebrews says, training your senses for righteousness. Just like the psalmist says, he guides me in paths of righteousness. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake because he's training my senses to discern between good and evil. And then it goes on and says, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. In other words, my soul is ready, Lord. My soul is ready because you've restored it. And even though I may go through the darkest valley, that external stimuli of darkness valley, those painful things, the grief that I suffer, those things that happen in life that affect me, guess what? I will fear no evil for you are with me. For you are with me. For you are with me. I don't have to fear because my God is with me. 
the beauty of him touching your soul is no matter what you face in the future, my God is with me. No matter what emotions I may feel, my God is with me. God bless you. Pray about this word.